America's passenger rail network has always lagged behind those of countries such as France and Japan, despite the fact that the United States is one of the most developed countries in the world. Over the years, many projects, both privately and government funded, have been created, all with the common goal of providing the country with safe, fast, and environmentally friendly high-speed trains. After all, as climate change continues to become more and more of a pressing issue, the use of trains continues to be a much better alternative to cars and trucks for both passenger and freight traffic. Join me as I explore these projects to improve our rail infrastructure in American High Speed Rail Week 2, my five-part documentary coming up right now. Part 1, California High-Speed Rail, Moving Forward Currently, if you want to travel between Los Angeles and San Francisco, you can either endure a 6-hour drive, not even accounting for traffic, you can take a bus, which will take even longer than driving, you can fly, which is expensive and inconvenient, or you can take an Amtrak train, which takes 12 hours and takes you across the bay to Oakland. This dilemma is exactly what voters considered in the California state election of 2008 when they approved $9 billion in state funding for a future high-speed rail link between these two cities. This project would later come to be known as California High-Speed Rail, and since I already explained the history of this project in last year's American High-Speed Rail Week, I'll just give you a quick crash course. Chapter 1. History in 1996, the California High-Speed Rail Authority was created to plan a ballot measure for voters to vote for funding for a high-speed rail network connecting California's two biggest urban centers of LA and San Francisco. By 2008, a plan was laid out to get funding for $9 billion in state funding, and in order to secure this funding, they would have to run trains at speeds of at least 200 miles per hour, have a travel time of fewer than 2 hours and 40 minutes between LA and San Francisco, and to be financially self-sustainable, meaning that the revenue made from operating trains would recoup the operating and maintenance costs. If these plans were not met, the project would not receive funding. Luckily, this plan was supported by about 53% of voters, mostly in the Bay Area, so the project barely got away with funding. By 2010, a system was planned out with a loose alignment between the two cities, which we'll now get into in the next part of the video. Chapter 2, The Route As I just said, by 2010, the general route alignment was decided on, and let's just say it wasn't the best. Now, it's common knowledge that the most direct route between two points is a straight line, but it seems that the people managing this project didn't ever learn this in school, because instead of loosely following the Pacific coastline up the whole way, the proposed route takes a turn way far inland, being rooted through the Central Valley, which is home to such cities as Bakersfield, Fresno, and Merced. All cities with decent populations, but nothing compared to the two main cities. Anyways, this route was split into two phases, with Phase 1 initially being from Anaheim, California, just south of LA, to the planned Salesforce Transit Center in San Francisco, which is currently just the bus terminal. Additionally, Phase 1 would include a branch line to Merced with a high-speed Y, so trains wouldn't have to slow down much when joining the main line. Phase 2 would expand this branch line to Sacramento and add another branch line from Los Angeles to San Diego via San Bernardino. Throughout 2010 and 2011, environmental impact studies began in the Central Valley, and over the course of those two years, the federal government granted an additional $6.25 billion in funding to the project, deeming it, along with a handful of other projects, to be among the biggest future high-speed rail projects in the country. Finally, in 2012, California Governor Jerry Brown approved the construction of the initial Phase 1 mainline, and an official alignment between Los Angeles and San Francisco was finalized. So with that, construction was ready to begin, but before we learn about the construction project, let's first learn about the route. The decided alignment is a 380 mile stretch between the two aforementioned cities of LA and San Francisco, but let's take a look at what the line will look like for Phase 1 of the project. Beginning at the existing King Street Station in San Francisco, the line will run on the Caltrain Corridor south to San Jose de Redon Station, with an intermediate stop at Millbrae Station for some trains. South of San Jose, the line will continue on Caltrain onwards towards Gilroy, which is the end of the line for Caltrain. South of Gilroy, the line will make a turn east to a line built completely from scratch for high-speed rail, heading towards Madera, but between Gilroy and Madera, the aforementioned high-speed Y will allow for some trains to turn north towards Merced and eventually Modesto, Stockton, and Sacramento once phase 2 of the project is completed. After Madera, the line will begin heading south with the next stop in Fresno. After Fresno will be Kings Tulare, which is near Hanford. Next, the line will head southeast to Bakersfield before descending into the Los Angeles Basin, stopping at Palmdale with an eventual connection to Brightline West which I'll talk about later. 
After Palmdale, the line will continue south, loosely following the Metrolink Antelope Valley line, stopping at Burbank Airport before reaching the end of the line at Los Angeles Union Station. Additionally, there are plans to have the line continue south to Anaheim, but that part of the project has been temporarily put on hold. Finally, for Phase 2. In addition to the expansion north from Merced to Sacramento, Phase 2 of the project will also continue south from Los Angeles to San Diego via San Bernardino. Speed limits on the line will be 110 miles per hour between San Francisco and Gilroy, and 220 miles per hour between Gilroy and Los Angeles using double tracking along the entire line except for in stations which will have four tracks to allow for express trains to overtake stopping trains. Alright, now that I've explained the line in good detail, we can talk more about the construction process. Chapter 3, Construction Ground was officially broken in the Central Valley in 2015, with initial construction being split into four so-called CPs or construction packages. Those being CP1, Madera to just south of Fresno where construction began in 2015, CP2 and CP3 continuing south to around Kings Tulare, construction began in 2018, and CP4 which continued to just south of Bakersfield beginning in 2019. As of right now, construction is ongoing for the 119 miles between Madera and Bakersfield, and most of the infrastructure to support the tracks such as bridges, viaducts, and other forms of grade separation are almost completed, and sometime in 2022, it's expected that tracks, signals, and overhead electric wires will be installed on this 119 mile segment of the line. Funding for the rest of Phase 1 is expected to be received at some point in the near future too, as by the end of 2023, all environmental studies will be completed between Los Angeles and San Francisco. When all is said and done, the first segment, the 170 mile line from Bakersfield to Merced, will hopefully begin service in 2029, with the line opening further north to San Francisco in 2031, and finally fully starting service on all of Phase 1 between LA and San Francisco in 2033. Of course, these dates are still tentative, and for years they've been pushing back the initial date of service, but with the current pace that construction is moving along at, it's actually looking like these dates for initial service could be met. It's all just a matter of whether construction is managed effectively. Chapter 4, Infrastructure In terms of the specific infrastructure being used, California High Speed Rail will use a lot of grade separation, often running trains over viaducts separated from railroad crossings and other issues posed by tracks at grade. This grade separation, along with gentle curves, will allow for trains to go at speeds never seen before in the United States. This line will obviously be electrified, but it will use 25 kV at 60 Hz alternating current, which is generally accepted to be the standard for high-speed train lines being used on the Amtrak Northeast Corridor between Boston and New Haven and Japan's Tokaido Shinkansen. Aside from the grade separated 220 mph section between Gilroy and Los Angeles, California High Speed Rail will share the line with Caltrain Commuter Rail, which will be less grade separated with a top speed of only 110 miles per hour. Chapter 5 Connections Since California High Speed Rail spans across a big state, naturally it'll have quite a few connections, but what specifically are they? For this, I'll only be mentioning the commuter rails and future high speed rails that California High Speed Rail will connect to, as there are a lot of other transit methods that it'll connect with but the other railroads are the most significant. Let's begin at the northernmost part of the line and make our way south. As I just mentioned, California High Speed Rail will share the line with Caltrain between San Francisco and Gilroy, which will soon be electrified, but these plans for electrification have been underway for a while, as Caltrain's CalMod project plans to begin electrified service on their line between San Francisco and San Jose in late 2024, or let's be realistic, early 2025. Anyways, that doesn't really matter because California High Speed Rail won't reach San Francisco until at least 2030, but Caltrain has planned in advance for their arrival, as their new Stadler Kiss electric trains have doors at two different heights allowing for them to use the same platforms as the taller California High Speed Rail trains. South of San Jose, California High Speed Rail will be in charge of installing overhead wires, and it's still to be determined whether Caltrain will operate its electric trains using these wires, or whether they'll continue to run traditional diesel trains south of San Jose. After sharing the line with Caltrain as far south as Gilroy, California High Speed Rail won't directly share any existing line with any other railroads, but that doesn't mean it won't be able to connect with those other railroads. In Merced, California High Speed Rail will connect with Altamont Corridor Express, which is expanding to Merced as part of their Valley Rail extension. Additionally, this line will run parallel to the Phase 2 expansion to Sacramento. Merced, Madera, and Bakersfield will feature a connection to Amtrak's San Joaquin's, which will loosely parallel California High Speed Rail in the Central Valley. Finally, in Palmdale, California High Speed Rail will connect to privately funded Brightline West, which is another high speed rail project opening around the same time between Los Angeles and Las Vegas. Brightline West plans to operate a line between Palmdale and Victorville, 
where some trains will terminate and presumably some will go straight to Las Vegas from Palmdale, allowing for passengers to easily connect from California High Speed Rail to Brightline West. Additionally, Palmdale will allow for connections to local commuter rail Metrolink. Chapter 6, The Trains Now for the fun part, the trains. Unlike how Brightline West already has plans to buy Siemens Valaro trains, California High Speed Rail still hasn't decided on what specific trains it'll operate, but that doesn't mean they aren't looking. In January of 2015, the California High Speed Rail Authority submitted a request for a proposal for a train to operate on this line with some very specific requirements. Trains would need to be able to sustain speeds of 220 miles per hour, have a top speed of at least 242 miles per hour, a lifespan of 30 years, a length no longer than 680 feet, the ability to double up trains, and a bunch of other things that one would expect for high speed trains to have. As of now, no contract has been awarded yet, but a total of six manufacturers are currently interested, with those being Alstom, CRRC, Hyundai Rotem, Hitachi, Kawasaki, and Siemens. As of right now, it's too early to know which manufacturer will win the contract. As of right now, it's too early to know which manufacturer will win the contract. The California High Speed Rail Authority will most likely place multiple orders for trains, as the initial Merced to Bakersfield segment of the line will need only 4 trains initially. But once the full Phase 1 build is completed, another 12 trains will be needed. But the authority estimates that once service is in full swing, they'll need as many as 95 train sets. Unfortunately, since no manufacturer has won the contract yet, it's pretty hard to say what trains will look like, but over the years there have been some renderings, with the first being a train reminiscent of Trance's TGV duplex, and later renderings looking more like a Siemens Velaro train, once again similar to that of Brightline West. Generally, equipment orders take about 4-5 to five years to be fulfilled, so if the plan is to begin service in 2029, a contract will most likely be awarded sometime around 2023 or 2024. Chapter 7, My Opinion Ah yes, my opinion on this project. In the original video I made about California High Speed Rail, I poked quite a bit of fun at this project as construction has been infamously delayed and that's definitely not good. But I also have some critiques about the project itself. I do think that it's not great that the line will operate in basically the middle of nowhere for the first few years of its life, but it's less about the fact that the line will initially only operate in the Central Valley and more that it will operate there in the first place. In order to adhere to the 3 hour travel time between both ends of the line, California High Speed Rail will have to operate at 220 miles per hour, which is an unprecedented speed for North American railroads. I think that if it just bypassed these cities, taking a more direct route as I said in the beginning, California High Speed Rail could run at more realistic speeds. Of course, I could be missing something, and I'm sure there are a bunch of reasons why California High Speed Rail doesn't take the direct route, but that's just my opinion. Other than that, I'm always supportive of more trains, as obviously I'm a rail fan, so I don't really have any other critiques. I truly am excited for the future of this project, despite the fact that there will most certainly be more challenges in its future. Chapter 8, Conclusion Overall, we can really only hope for the best when it comes to California High Speed Rail, but I'm certainly hopeful for the future of this line, because as I said, I'm always open to having more trains, but this project is certainly not going to happen overnight. As the years go on, I'm sure there will be more and more delays to the project, but hopefully sometime, maybe 15 or 20 years from now, California High Speed Rail will finally provide the much needed high speed rail connection between California's two biggest cities that it set out to create decades prior. Part 2, Brightline, A Bright Future Brightline is a relatively new intercity rail service in eastern Florida running along the Florida East Coast Railway between Miami Central Station and West Palm Beach. Since its inception in 2018, Brightline has operated hourly and bi-hourly trains in each direction and between 12 and 16 round trips every day between the two current terminals. Chapter 1, Background Unlike almost every other passenger railroad in North America, Brightline has always been privately funded, receiving funding from Fortress Investment Group rather than the government like Amtrak does. When Brightline began operating in 2018, its goal was not only to provide a convenient and fast mode of transportation, but also to create a more modern and comfortable experience, unlike Amtrak where trains and stations are pretty bare bones and designed more for function than anything else. Brightline stations are beautiful public spaces often featuring modern interiors with trendy restaurants, shopping, and among all else, the smell of fresh Florida citrus, which apparently is what all Brightline stations smell like. These welcoming environments continue onto the trains which were all built rather recently. Train interiors feature large airplane style seats, ample legroom, large screens displaying information such as time in the next stops, and those pretty blue LED lights lining the ceiling. Now that we're talking about the cars, let's get more specific in talking about the train sets and their specs. Brightline's trains are sets of four Siemens Venture cars with a Siemens Charger locomotive on each end. The first order of train sets was placed in 2014, with five trains being delivered between 2016 and 2017, although five more train sets are set to be delivered through the end of 2022. 
These venture cars are quickly becoming very popular due to their attractive interiors and proven reliability, and after Brightline's cars proved to be among the best in the industry, orders were placed by the California Department of Transportation, Amtrak Midwest, Via Rail, and in 2021, Amtrak announced that they would be ordering a $7 billion fleet of venture cars to replace their aging Amfleet cars. Similarly, Brightline's locomotives are also considered to be state-of-the-art, being manufactured by Siemens at the same time as the venture cars. These locomotives are classified as SCB-40s, and they're basically just modified versions of Amtrak's SC-44 Charger locomotives, featuring 400 less horsepower, a streamlined front end, and other minor changes. The Chargers use a Cummins QSK-95 Turbo Diesel V16, and if you know anything about trucks, you would know that Cummins makes some of the most dependable diesel engines in the world, so these locomotives are quite reliable. These locomotives have a top speed of 125 miles per hour while achieving tier 4 emissions, the best possible diesel emissions rating for locomotives currently. Additionally, they run on renewable biodiesel fuel, so they're just about as environmentally friendly as a locomotive can get. Basically, it's safe to say that Brightline's trains are state of the art, and I might say they're some of the best looking trains in America. These trains currently operate between Miami and West Palm Beach, reaching a top speed of 79 miles per hour which allows them to travel the 70 miles between the two terminals in 1 hour and 12 minutes, which is marginally faster than driving, but a lot more comfortable obviously. Anyways, now that we know about Brightline's current operation, let's go to Fort Lauderdale to see these trains in action. Chapter 2, Up Close and Personal Here we are in Fort Lauderdale, just south of Brightline Station here, and as you can see, the line is quite scenic, featuring views of the New River and some other nice surroundings such as the downtown area seen here in Fort Lauderdale. Fort Lauderdale, a quickly growing modern city, is one of America's first to feature modern trains. And look, here's one now, heading north from Miami, coasting across the New River Bridge. Not long after, a train passes heading south, as trains run almost hourly down here, even on weekends. This is southbound bright green train crossing over the river. Chapter 3, The Future Since Brightline's inception in 2012, back when the project was still called All Aboard Florida, the goal was not just to have a 79 mile per hour inner city rail line between Miami and West Palm Beach, but rather to have a higher speed rail system to connect many of Florida's main cities. Even before Brightline began service on the east coast of Florida, a plan was in place for the next phase of expansion, that being the Orlando Extension. This expansion would have trains continue north from West Palm Beach on the Florida East Coast Freight Line, eventually diverging onto an all-new high-speed line in Cocoa being built from scratch along the State Route 528 right-of-way. One of the most common criticisms of Brightline is that it's not truly a high-speed line because in its current state it only reaches a top speed of 79 miles per hour. But what many don't realize is that when this Orlando extension is completed, trains will run at 110 miles per hour between West Palm Beach and Cocoa and 125 miles per hour on the grade separated high-speed line between Cocoa and Orlando, allowing for trains to travel between Miami and Orlando in about 3 hours. Now where in Orlando would this line terminate? Well in 2015, Brightline decided that since Orlando is one of the most sprawling cities in America with major theme parks outside the city limits, there's not really good downtown area that would allow for easy access to these attractions. This meant that Brightline's Orlando station would be located at the Orlando International Airport, which just so happened to be building a new terminal with space for a train station. This new station was constructed next to the new South Terminal Complex, allowing for passengers to easily get off a plane, take the APM to the South Terminal, and connect to a Brightline train. Since then, construction has been ongoing at the new terminal, but the train station has basically been fully constructed. Let's check it out! Chapter 4, Exploring Orlando Station In order to get to the station, we're going to have to take the new APM or Automated People Mover from Terminal A to the new terminal. This new APM connects Terminal A to the South Terminal, connecting with the old trams to the existing terminals. Anyways, as we approach the South Terminal on board the APM, we can see concrete tied tracks leading up to the station. 
These tracks come right down from Route 528 where the grade separated line is, and they snake down through the airport, passing under the taxiway a couple of times. Soon enough, our APM arrives in the south terminal, and from there, most people getting off go to the employee parking lot while I'm the only one who goes into the train terminal. After going up the escalator, I'm greeted by an empty yet clean modern terminal which will soon be used by hundreds of passengers every day. The high ceilings and large open spaces really do make this look like a modern rail terminal, despite the fact that no trains run here yet. Speaking of where trains will run, let's take a look out the large windows, where we can see where the elevated tracks lead to. Here we are looking south, where you can see that signals are already in place in addition to the platforms. From here, trains will be able to run to the new maintenance facility just south of the station, which will serve as Brightline's main shops for repairing trains. Now let's check out the street level entrance to the station, where in the future people will be able to connect to ride sharing services in addition to Brightline Plus, a fleet of Tesla Model Ys that can drive passengers to their final destination. Now for one more look at the interior of the station. As of right now, it's still quite bare, but it should be fully furnished by the time service begins at this station in 2023. Now that we've seen much of the interior part of the station, let's take another look at the platforms. Unfortunately, as of right now, the platforms are closed to pedestrians because obviously no trains are running here right now. Now, but that doesn't mean that we can't get a good view of them. Here are the future Brightline platforms as seen from the APM platforms, where you can see that there are high level platforms but no tracks in place yet. This means that as of right now, the only tracks going through the station are the two going through the middle platforms, but soon there will be four tracks here. After this, I took the APM back to the main terminal, and from the APM you can see the tracks leading to the high speed line east of the airport. This New Orlando extension, along with the station, will be completed later this year with service beginning in early 2023. Additionally, there are a lot more projects going on in Florida, such as the rest of the line. Preparations for the line west of Orlando are ongoing, with a plan to run trains along Florida State Route 417 between Orlando Airport and Disney Springs Station by 2026. An intermediate station at the Meadowwoods Sunrail Station is also planned. West of Disney Springs, there's no projected completion date, but trains will run in the Interstate 4 right-of-way between Disney Springs and Tampa's Ybor City with an intermediate stop in Lakeland. In addition to this major extension to Tampa, stations are also currently under construction on the existing line in Boca Raton and Aventura, with those stations planned to open in 2023, around the same time as the Orlando extension. Finally, there are a couple more stations planned between Orlando and West Palm Beach, although that construction has not begun yet. Basically, right now, Brightline is busy completing the all-new line between in Cocoa and Orlando, while at the same time double tracking the existing line between West Palm Beach and Cocoa. Chapter 5 The Future Continued Now that we've talked about Brightline's biggest projects, such as its Orlando extension, let's talk about other smaller projects that are in progress. The first one that I feel is worth mentioning is Brightline's proposed commuter service that they want to start running. In 2020, Brightline announced its intentions to start operating a commuter service between Miami Central and Aventura, providing additional service for passengers during rush hour. This proposed service was quickly called Northeast Corridor Service, not to be confused with Amtrak's Northeast Corridor between Boston and Washington, D.C. This new service is proposed to begin as early as 2024, operating between Miami Central and Aventura, with intermediate stops at Wynwood, Miami's Design District, El Portal, North Miami, and FIU's Biscayne Bay campus. Again, this project is just in planning right now, so information is quite limited. In addition to this Brightline ran commuter rail, TriRail, the existing commuter rail in the Miami area, plans to use the same line as Brightline as well. Their current line is almost identical to that of Brightline's, running between Miami International Airport and just north of West Palm Beach, essentially following the same route as Brightline, just slightly inland. Over the years, TriRail has expressed interest in using the Florida East Coast Railway line though, as using that line would allow TriRail to offer service to downtown Miami, downtown Fort Lauderdale, and many more communities. This project is making good progress right now, with the first phase allowing for some tri-rail trains to use Brightline's Miami Central Station beginning later this year. Tri-rail plans to eventually run trains all the way between Miami Central and West Palm Beach, sharing the line with Brightline at some point. But that's still far off in the future, so just having tri-rail trains at Miami Central is all we will see in the near future. Finally, the last miscellaneous project going on between Miami and West Palm Beach is what has been called the Broward Commuter Rail. In late 2021, another commuter rail service has been proposed between Aventura and Deerfield Beach. This project has the least amount of information of these three, and all we know right now is that service can begin as early as 2028, but an operator nor funding source has been identified at this point. Other than that, there aren't many other major projects going on in Florida aside from smaller things like track improvements and a few other new stations. But in addition to Florida, Brightline is working on creating a 200 mile per hour high speed rail route between Los Angeles and Las Vegas known as Brightline West. 
As of right now, planning continues, but construction is planned to begin in 2023. So basically, as soon as Brightline is done with the Orlando extension, it'll be shifting its focus to the electrified line out west, which is set to begin service in 2026 or 2027. Chapter 6, The Trains Now that we've talked about the line and the future of it, let's talk about Brightline's trains and what they'll look like in the future. As I said before, right now Brightline operates five Siemens Venture train sets with two SCB-40 Charger locomotives and four cars each. For the Orlando extension, Brightline ordered five more trains and a spare locomotive, so by the time the Orlando line opens, Brightline will have a total of 10 train sets and one spare locomotive, making for a total of 40 cars and 21 locomotives. Since the original design of all of Brightline's stations, the railroad has planned to operate 10 car trains, hence why the current 4 car trains look so small on Brightline's long platforms, so in the future, Brightline will most likely order even more cars, allowing for them to expand trains to 10 cars each. Other than that, all their train sets are pretty new, so obviously no replacement for them is planned yet, but as I talked about a few minutes ago, Brightline's new commuter service between Miami and Aventura might use new commuter-oriented trains, but as of right now, we don't know what exactly these trains will look like. They could just be the regular Brightline trains we see now. Additionally, the Brightline West Line will use Siemens Velaro train sets, although no order has been placed, as construction on the actual line itself hasn't even started yet. An order will probably be placed sometime around 2024. Chapter 7, Conclusion After visiting this line myself and even sneaking into the yet-to-be-opened Orlando station, I've come to the conclusion that Brightline sure knows how to run a railroad, and even though right now it only goes 79 miles per hour, and just under a year from now, Brightline will routinely run trains up to 125 miles per hour on an all-new high-speed line, all while doing it comfortably and affordably. With all that's happening with Brightline, and especially with how they've already acquired another new high-speed rail project out west, it's pretty clear that Brightline intends to build an American high-speed rail empire, and it's looking like they'll be doing it in an efficient manner too, as being a private company, there are much fewer bureaucratic hurdles to overcome. Perhaps a few decades in the future, you may find yourself riding on a high-speed Brightline train in your city, and that's very exciting to me. Part 3. Amtrak. The future is now. Since the 2010s, Amtrak has been working quite a bit to improve its infamously old trains, some of which date back to the mid-1970s. Since recently, Amtrak has been receiving more funding than it has in the past, there's been an influx of equipment orders, service expansion plans, and other infrastructure projects, all of which are very interesting to rail fans and travelers alike. This video will be split into a few parts, all of which will focus on specific projects that Amtrak is working on to improve its trains and services over the next few years. So with that said, let's get right into it. Chapter 1. Acela 2 High Speed Trains Perhaps the most exciting project Amtrak has been undertaking lately is the replacement of their current Acela trains which operate on their most profitable route, the Acela Express. The Acela Express started operating on the electrified Northeast Corridor between Boston and Washington DC in the year 2000, using Alstom slash Bombardier Acela train sets. Acela was America's first high speed rail, reaching a top speed of 150 miles per hour for a stretch of the northern portion of its route in New England. When the Acela was introduced at the turn of the century, it quickly became a household name, as high-speed rail was a futuristic concept at the time, the likes of which the US had never seen before. It also became Amtrak's most profitable route as I said before, being able to charge more for tickets with faster travel times, newer trains, and better service for passengers on board. Since 2000, the original Acela trains have been pretty reliable, braving cold winters and humid summers in the northeast, but as the years have gone on, these original Acela trains have been starting to look more and more outdated, and as a premium service, passengers demand modern trains. In the mid-2010s, Amtrak knew this was beginning to happen, so they started their search for a replacement for the aging Acela train sets. As was the case with the original Acelas, Amtrak turned to Europe's high-speed rail expertise for inspiration for their new trains. Amtrak was inspired by France's Alstom Avelia Euro duplex trains seen on the TGV, which were manufactured by the same company as the original Acelas, so in late 2016, Amtrak received a $2.4 billion loan from the federal government to order a fleet of new high-speed trains built by Alstom. These trains were to be built on Alstom's next generation Avelia platform, which was a global platform in which similar trains were ordered by SNCF later on. Soon enough, Alstom and Amtrak released a video teasing this new train, which was to be named the Avelia Liberty. This animated video shows mock-ups of these Liberty train sets operating on a modernized northeast corridor, providing high-speed service with modern era train sets. To replace the first gen Acelas, Amtrak ordered 28 Avelia Liberties or Acela 2s, which were not only bigger, consisting of 9 cars instead of 6, but 
also faster, being able to hit a theoretical top speed of 220 miles per hour instead of 165 as seen on the original Acelas. Of course, in service, these trains would only be able to do 150 miles per hour as the current Acelas do, but Amtrak planned for future services to be able to go much faster with necessary track improvements. Anyways, the first of these 28 train sets began production about a year later in late 2017 at Alstom's facilities in upstate New York. As production continued, Amtrak's mock-up art became more accurate, with the paint scheme being changed from the original blue and red paint scheme to a cleaner blue and white paint scheme. By 2020, the first train sets were completed, with the first train being released from Alstom in February being sent to Pueblo, Colorado to be tested by the Federal Railroad Administration for 9 months. The next month, train set 2 was released from Alstom's plant, this time heading east to Philadelphia where testing would begin on the Northeast Corridor. Both of these trains were completely unfurnished, being filled with computers for crews to monitor the train systems, and at this point, trains were expected to enter service in 2021, with the full fleet of original Acelas being retired by late 2021. Unfortunately, as testing continued, the new trains were found to have quite a few issues, specifically pertaining to their pantographs, which would bounce on and off the overhead wire at high speeds, causing the train to lose power. By 2021, testing continued on the Northeast Corridor, with modifications being done to the pantographs to mitigate the issues. Later in the year, Train Set 1 was returned from Colorado and it began to be furnished at Alstom's factory in New York. A few months later, in November of 2021, Train Set 3 made its way east from New York, being the first fully furnished Acela 2 train set. It soon joined Train Set 2 in Philadelphia, where testing continues to this day. 2021, the year when the Acela 2s were supposed to enter service, has come and gone, and now in 2022, none of these trains are operating in revenue service. Unfortunately, a laundry list of hardware issues and production issues have all come together to delay this project quite a bit. Nowadays, information on what's going on is quite scarce, but for now, the plan is for these trains to enter service in 2023, with the full replacement and retirement of the original Acelas coming in 2025. Amtrak's next plans for these trains are to begin qualification runs in the final months of 2022, and by early to mid-2023, the first four Acela 2s will hopefully enter revenue service. Until then, all we can do is hope for the best and enjoy the old Acelas while we still Still have them. As to what will happen with the OG Acelas after they're retired, we still don't know, but I wouldn't be surprised if a power car, or maybe even a whole train would be donated to a museum. Luckily, there is some better news. Despite all the setbacks due to hardware issues, the Acela 2 train sets continue to be built, and now that the first fully furnished train has been delivered to Amtrak, we have concrete proof that this project is moving along, just at a pretty slow pace. Anyways, as I said, we can only really hope for the best with the new Acelas, but when they enter service, they'll definitely be some of the world's most technologically advanced modern trains. Chapter 2. New Long Distance Locomotives since the early 90s, General Electric Genesis series locomotives have formed the backbone of Amtrak's fleet with over 250 locomotives in service across the country. Since they were introduced in the 90s, these locomotives have proven reliable, but as some start to turn 25 and even 30 years old, their shortcomings become more and more obvious. For one, Genesis locomotives, along with all other GE locomotives from the 90s, are prone to turbo oil seal failure, which causes hot oil to get into the exhaust, often causing fires. Additionally, Genesis locomotives were built in the 1990s, which was right before diesel emissions regulations took effect in the United States. Since then, climate change has become a much more pressing issue, so the EPA has created strict regulations which initially took effect in 1996, right after most of Amtrak's Genesis locomotives were built. Over the years, the regulations have gotten more and more stringent and nowadays, all new locomotives have to adhere to Tier 4 emission standards, which are the EPA's strictest, reducing particulate matter and nitrous oxides by 90% from Tier 0 standards. Anyways, in the interest of having modern, reliable, and most importantly, environmentally friendly locomotives, Amtrak began to search for a replacement for their aging GEs. Following the success of Amtrak's new ACS-64 and SC-44 locomotives throughout the 2010s, Amtrak turned to Siemens once again for another locomotive design, this time for a long-distance diesel. In December of 2018, an agreement was reached between Amtrak and Siemens Mobility for 75 new long-distance locomotives using the proven Siemens Charger platform. This new locomotive would be similar to the existing SC-44 chargers used on state-supported routes while being slightly more ideal for long-distance service. These new long-distance chargers would have larger fuel tanks, extra comfortable cabs, modern computer systems, and 200 less horsepower, reducing stress on the prime mover and allowing for longer service intervals. Naturally, when this order was announced, concept art was also released, and as many expected, the new Charger locomotives looked identical to the short-distance ones already operated by Amtrak. 
just in a phase 5 paint scheme. Anyways, this order called for the first locomotive to enter service in 2021, so Siemens got to work designing the locomotive as soon as possible. After two years of Amtrak and Siemens working together to design the optimal locomotive for their long distance services, more details were revealed, and it turned out these locomotives were going to be quite different from the renderings from 2018. Once again, renderings were released, but this time around, the locomotive looked much more unique. Obviously, as you can tell, the front end is completely different using a removable nose cone instead of the notched nose design seen on the SC44 chargers. Additionally, the paint scheme was something completely different from the 2018 rendering, featuring a much more modern and colorful design. Finally, the official classification of these locomotives was revealed to be ALC42, or Amtrak Long Distance Charger 42, meaning 4200 horsepower. Once again, Siemens and Amtrak went quiet on the Long Distance Charger project until June 11th, 2021, when the first ALC42 number 300 was released from the Siemens Mobility Factory in Florin, California. After traveling across the country to Washington, D.C., 300 was moved to Delaware to begin the early phases of testing. Also around this time, Amtrak revealed that the ALC42s will be painted in more than one paint scheme. 300 was said to be painted in a new phase 6 paint scheme, which surprisingly would not be the main paint scheme seen on these locomotives, but rather just a placeholder scheme, as the main paint scheme wasn't ready in time for the first locomotives. Anyways, 8 ALC42s would wear phase 6, those being 300 and 302 through 308. Now you may be wondering, why did I skip 301? Well good thing you asked, because 301 may possibly be the most interesting ALC42 of all, as this one was released from Siemens wearing a black coat of Amtrak paint, paying homage to Amtrak 4316, an X-Pen Central E8 hastily painted into a contrived Amtrak paint scheme for Amtrak's first day of service in 1971. This commemorative unit for Amtrak's 50th anniversary was dubbed the Day 1 unit, and it was delivered just over a month after 300. Finally, locomotives 309 through 374 were to wear Phase 7, a slightly less complicated version of Phase 6, which will most likely become Amtrak's standard paint scheme across their system in the future. So back to the actual locomotives. Throughout 2021, ALC42s tested a little bit in the Northeast, but other than that they just sat around receiving software tweaks. By the end of 2021, the first four locomotives have been delivered, and soon enough, Amtrak would begin the process of putting the ALC42s into service. In January of 2022, Amtrak began to move the ALC42s to various crew bases around the country, and soon enough, crews were being trained on these brand new locomotives. Finally, on February 8th, 2022, ALC42s number 301 and 302 were put on the westbound Amtrak Empire Builder, and after four years of hard work, the ALC42s entered service without any issues. Nah, just kidding. Right before departing Chicago's Union Station, 301 suffered a PTC failure, calling for a P42 to be put in front of the two chargers. Unfortunately, the ALC42's first time in service wasn't as triumphant as planned, but to Siemens' credit, the PTC failure was not their fault, as the onboard PTC systems are made by Wabtec, not Siemens. Despite a slightly rocky debut, the ALC42 successfully pulled the train from Chicago to Spokane, Washington, and in Spokane, 301 trailed behind a P42 to Portland, Oregon, while 302 got to lead the Seattle section of the train. Additionally, back in Chicago, Amtrak had announced that they added 50 new locomotives to this order, making for a total of 125 ALC42s to be delivered between 2021 and 2027. So that leaves us in the present day. As of when this video is being put out, ALC42s are in the beginning stages of their introduction to long distance service. The first two routes to receive chargers were the Empire Builder and the City of New Orleans, but after those routes, in mid-2022, ALC-42s will be deployed in Washington, D.C. After Washington receives chargers, they'll be deployed on all other northeastern diesel-based routes by late 2022, and finally, in 2023, all other long-distance routes will gradually receive their own ALC-42s. Luckily, this project hasn't been delayed like projects such as the Acela 2s, so if all goes according to plan, over the next two or three years, Amtrak long-distance trains will begin to look a lot more modern, and ALC-42s will replace Genesis locomotives as the backbone of Amtrak's fleet, providing more reliable service while creating one-tenth the emissions. Chapter 3 Siemens Venture Cars The last two projects I talked about are fine and dandy, but the new diesel locomotives don't really do a whole lot for passengers, short of increased reliability, and the Acela 2s obviously improve passenger experience, but only for those traveling between Boston and Washington DC. Luckily, for those outside of the Northeast, there's one project that'll improve equipment on over half of Amtrak's routes, and this project is called the Siemens Venture Project. 
The story begins in 2012 when a consortium of states composed of California, Illinois, Michigan, and Missouri announced a $352 million order for a fleet of 130 so-called next-generation bi-level passenger cars built by Nippon Shario. These new cars were to be an improved version of the existing bi-level California cars and surf liners, replacing Horizon cars and Comet cars in California and the Midwest with modern bi-level coaches. The first of these cars were supposed to be delivered between 2015 and 2018, with 88 cars going to the Midwest and 42 going to California. Unfortunately, as the design phase of these cars went on, it seemed like no progress was being made. 2015, the year when the first cars were planned to be delivered, came and went, and by May of that same year, Nippon Shario announced that they were 14 months behind in the production of these cars. With this unfortunate news, the project continued, but a few months later in August, it all came crashing down when a prototype car failed key safety tests. With this, Nippon Shario announced that these cars would have to be completely redesigned, delaying the project another two years further. With this news, the contract was terminated, leaving the states to search for a new manufacturer of these cars. Luckily, in November of 2017, the state consortium announced that they had indeed found a new manufacturer of these cars and the design would be completely different from that of Nippon Shario's. Instead of using bi-level cars similar to those used on Amtrak California services, they would instead be ordering a fleet of 137 single-level cars manufactured by Siemens Mobility. These new cars were to be based on the existing Siemens Venture cars used on Brightline, but with slightly less luxury-oriented interiors. Of the 137 cars ordered, 49 would go to California for use on the San Joaquins, and 88 would go to Chicago, being used on basically every Amtrak Midwest train. For these two specific regions, there would be slightly different formats of these cars too, with California getting seven semi-permanently coupled sets of seven cars each, with four economy seating cars, two economy seating cars with vending machines, and one cab car with economy seating, which will use the same front end design as the Siemens Charger locomotives which operate on this route. In the Midwest, trains would vary in length, meaning that train sets would not be permanently coupled, rather using sets of two semi-permanently coupled cars and single cars. Additionally, the Midwest would be receiving dedicated cafe cars and combination economy and business class cars. On top of that, in 2019, the state of Wisconsin added nine cars to the order, adding six coaches and three coach cab cars for the Hiawatha service, most likely also using the SC44 style cab design. Deliveries were planned to take place between 2020 and 2023, and just as expected, in 2020, the first car was delivered to Amtrak, beginning high-speed testing on the Northeast Corridor soon after. Soon enough, cars began to be delivered to both Northern California and the Midwest, and testing began there too. Unfortunately, as the testing process continued, a pretty alarming issue came to light, that being the fact that trace amounts of lead were found in the water treatment systems of these cars, which were manufactured by a different subcontractor than those of Brightline. Anyways, this issue brought the project to a halt, delaying their debut into regular service, as Siemens Mobility worked to fix the issues. New water management systems were retrofitted onto the existing cars, allowing for testing to start again in mid to late 2021, and by the end of the year, Venture cars were ready to enter service. Amtrak Midwest Ventures made their in-service debut on February 1st, 2022, when they were seen on Amtrak Lincoln service train number 303. As you can see from this footage of their debut, the train was unfortunately not all Venture cars, but it was close enough as the cafe cars haven't been delivered yet, so one AM fleet is necessary to provide food to passengers. As of when this video is being completed, Venture cars are slowly being entered into service in the Midwest at a rate of 8 cars per month, and Venture cars in California haven't entered service quite yet, but they should be very soon. Production of the remaining cars in this order is ongoing at Siemens, with cab cars and cafe cars beginning production as of when this video is being uploaded. Despite the setbacks in these cars entering service, the actual production and delivery of these Venture cars hasn't really been delayed that much, which is definitely very good for Amtrak. Between now and late 2023, all 146 of these cars should be delivered, greatly improving service for passengers in Northern California and the Midwest. But remember at the beginning of this part of the video where I said that Siemens Venture cars would replace old equipment on over half of Amtrak's routes? Well Amtrak Midwest and the San Joaquins are obviously much less than half of Amtrak's routes, so what about basically every other route? Well that's where Amtrak's massive $7.3 billion order with Siemens Mobility comes in. In July of 2021, Amtrak announced that it had made a deal with Siemens Mobility to build a replacement for all Amfleet 1 cars across the system, which are the backbone of Amtrak's fleet in the Northeast on some of their most vital routes. In an article written by Amtrak, a plan was laid out for the acquisition of 83 Siemens Venture Intercity train sets with options for an additional 130 trains should Amtrak want to expand service further. Now, let's go into further detail. This project will be split into three phases, all of which will work to improve intercity routes in specific regions. This first phase, which is also the shortest, will be the replacement of the aging train sets on Amtrak's Cascades route, which will use Siemens Venture cars similar to those seen in Northern California and the Midwest. 
Between 2024 and 2025, eight six-car train sets will be delivered, consisting of five coaches and one cab car, which will most likely have an SC44 style cab to match the existing SC44 locomotives currently used on this route. This phase of the 83 train set order will be the only one that doesn't include locomotives, just being a relatively basic order of cars and cab cars. Additionally, this phase is the only one where the specific amount of cars on order has been confirmed. Although phase 1 doesn't really sound that groundbreaking, the next phase certainly is. Phase 2, by far the biggest and most impactful phase, will be the replacement of all equipment used in the Northeast Regional, Palmetto, Carolinian, Downeaster, Keystone, Hartford Line, Valley Flyer, Pennsylvania, and Vermont routes. Now if you're very observant, you may notice that almost all of these routes are partially electrified and partially diesel powered. So how does Amtrak plan to use the same equipment on both types of routes? It's simple really. This part of the order will include dual mode locomotives capable of using both diesel and electric power, allowing for seamless power changes in places where electrification ends and begins, such as Washington DC. For this part of the order, Siemens will be building 58 Venture train sets, but in addition to the standard cars and cap cars, they'll also be building a fleet of dual mode locomotives. This new type of locomotive will be known as the ALC42E, and will be similar to the existing diesel only ALC42, will be incapable of switching between diesel and overhead electricity, drawing power from a trailing Venture car with the Panagraph. This part of the order will take place between 2025 and 2029, and unfortunately, at this point in time, we have no formal renderings of these cars. But what we do know is that these train sets will consist of an ALC42E, a varying number of Siemens Venture cars, and an ALC42 styled Siemens Venture cab car. Most surprisingly, these dual mode ALC42Es will replace most Siemens ACS64 locomotives which will be rendered obsolete by dual mode trains. The only purpose the ACS 64s will serve is pulling select long distance trains between New York and Washington and serving as spare locomotives, so Amtrak will most likely sell off most of their ACS 64s to local commuter rails midway through their life as only a handful of sprinters will be needed for these routes. Finally, the third and possibly the most ambitious phase is the replacement of all equipment used on the Empire Service, Ethan Allen Express, Maple Leaf, and Adirondack routes. Between 2029 and 2030, 17 train sets will be delivered using the same Siemens Venture cars but no cab cars. Much like Phase 2, this portion of the order will replace aging Amfleet 1s, but that's where the similarities end. Instead of using dual mode locomotives that use overhead electricity, these locomotives will be able to hook up to auxiliary trailer cars which will use Amtrak's first ever battery power system as opposed to overhead electricity. With this said, as far as I know they'll still be classified as ALC42Es. Additionally, much like the P32 ACDMs they'll replace, these locomotives will have third rail shoes making it possible to tap into third rail electricity on the Empire Corridor between New York City and Croton Harmon. In short, this $7.3 billion contract between Siemens and Amtrak will replace Talgo train sets on the Cascades, Amfleet 1s and Metroliner cab cars as a whole, most electric only ACS64 locomotives, and all P32 ACDM dual mode locomotives between 2024 and 2030. Of course, as of right now, we don't know many specific details, but as the development process continues for these train sets, more details will be revealed. According to a recent Amtrak presentation, the final design for these cars is due on October 17th, 2023, so between then and now, we should see some concept art for these trains. Supposedly, after October of 2023, the construction of these trains will begin, and the following year, delivery will begin. In conclusion, the Siemens acquisitions have been a breath of fresh air for Amtrak fans, as instead of the usual constant delays seen on projects such as the Viewliner 2 project, the cancelled next-gen bi-level project, and of course the Acela 2 project, Siemens seems to be good at building quality rail equipment in a timely manner, and Amtrak knows this, hence why by 2030, the majority of their fleet will be built by Siemens, which is quickly becoming one of the biggest names in American passenger rail. Chapter 4. What else are we missing? Now these past two projects I've talked about will replace the majority of Amtrak's outdated equipment system-wide, such as the original Acela train sets, Horizon cars, and Amfleet 1 cars, and of course the iconic P42 diesel locomotives. So what else is missing? For the most part, surprisingly not much, but I did manage to find one route that desperately needs some attention, and that route is the Piedmont. Amtrak's Piedmont service is one of their most overlooked services, and as a state-supported corridor route in North Carolina, it makes sense why. Unfortunately, due to low ridership numbers and in turn, not enough funding, the Piedmont still uses cars built in the 50s and 60s. Its locomotives are not much better, being EMD F59PH and F59PHI locomotives, which have been retired everywhere else except for in Northern California, where they received heavy-duty overhauls in order to conform to EPA Tier 2 emission standards. 
As of right now, there's no planned replacement for the Piedmont equipment, but that doesn't mean that it'll stay that way forever. This is just speculation, but since the Piedmont is a corridor route, it'll most likely get equipment similar to that of Amtrak Midwest or Amtrak California, that being Siemens Chargers and Venture Cars. Remember when I mentioned that Amtrak ordered 83 train sets, but they had the option to order 130 more? Well, if they decide to order any more trains from Siemens, perhaps some could be for North Carolina. If they do end up doing this, I would expect them to order 3 or 4 trains consisting of 1 SC44 Charger locomotive, 4 Siemens Venture cars, and 1 SC44 styled Venture cab car. Of course, this is just speculation on my part, but it could and certainly should happen in the near future. Aside from that, there really aren't many other pieces of equipment that are super old on Amtrak, with exception of the viewliners, which are quite old, although they should have a few more years left in service since they're being refurbished right now. Another bit of speculation though, is that Amtrak will begin the process of repainting most of their equipment to Phase 7 paint to match their new Siemens ALC42s. I theorize that over the next few years, we'll start to see ACS 64s, Superliners, Amfleet 2s, and perhaps even a few P42s being painted into this new paint scheme. Finally, the last bit of speculation I want to throw in here has to do with what will happen to Amtrak's P42 locomotives after they're retired in favor of Siemens ALC42s. When they were originally ordered, many speculated that after all ALC42s were entered into service, P42s would be gutted and turned into non-powered control units similar to what Amtrak did when the F40s were retired many years ago. Despite the fact that it would definitely make sense for Amtrak to replace the aging F40 NPCUs with P42s, I doubt this will happen for two reasons. The main reason why I think Amtrak won't turn their P42s into MPCUs is simply that they have new cab cars on order with Siemens. MPCUs essentially serve the same purpose as cab cars, short of the fact that they hold baggage instead of passengers. But in this current day and age, the use of a baggage car is fleeting. Anyways, the F40 MPCUs will definitely be retired once venture cab cars enter service, but that won't be for a few years. What if the P42s are rebuilt into MPCUs just to be used for the next 5 to 10 years? Well, the reason why this won't happen is that the P42s are built from one singular locomotive shell as opposed to multiple parts, so if a sliding baggage door was added on the side of a P42, it would greatly reduce its structural rigidity. Aside from that, Amtrak is actually in the process of making more MPCUs, but instead of being based on F40s this time, they'll be based on HHP electric locomotives. As of right now, the locomotives are in the process of being designed as cab cars, but in a year or so, a select number of de-electrified HHP8s will supplement aging F40 MPCUs in service. Other than that, there really isn't a whole lot of equipment that'll need to be replaced in the coming years, as Amtrak's many orders with Siemens Mobility cover a pretty big percentage of Amtrak routes. Right now, it seems hard to believe that over the course of the next 10 years, the majority of Amtrak's fleet will be replaced with brand new Siemens equipment, but if all goes according to the plan, that'll be the first time ever where Amtrak has a modern fleet, which is crazy to think of as a rail fan. Chapter 5, Conclusion after years of using the same equipment, Amtrak has finally received the funding for its biggest fleet rejuvenation ever, replacing aging equipment on almost all routes across its system. Right now, it's hard to believe, but in less than 10 years, Amtrak's trains will look completely different using environmentally friendly trains built for the 21st century. Of course, 10 years is a long time, and this will be a long process, but it'll be very cool to see how much America's railroad will change in that time, and I'll make sure to continue to provide updates as the process goes on. Part 4. Hydrogen and Batteries. Better than diesel trains? For the past 50 years, trains have been powered by one of two power sources, either diesel fuel or electric power captured from overhead catenary wires or third rail. Right now, these two methods of powering a train are the primary ones used in the United States, but as the world becomes more focused on slowing the effects of climate change, train manufacturers are becoming increasingly focused on finding the train of the future, creating zero emissions all while being just as efficient as a traditional diesel or electric locomotive. Generally, of these new zero emissions locomotives, there are two main power sources, those being hydrogen fuel cell and battery electric power. Before we learn about these two types of locomotives, let's first learn about why we're looking for an alternative to what we have now. Chapter 1. Why change? In America, the rails are ruled by diesel locomotives, which obviously are not very good for the environment. Despite the fact that diesel locomotives create large amounts of pollution, they're proportionately better for the environment than trucks or buses, as their emissions are offset by how much freight or how many passengers they can transport. Still, any carbon emissions are bad, and it's not exactly a good look for a rail company if their trains are creating massive clouds of black smoke, regardless of how much better they are for the environment than trucks that can only carry one shipping container at a time. Other than diesel locomotives, which make up the majority of trains in the US, we have a select few electric trains, drawing power from either overhead wires or third rail. 
Although they create zero emissions, the infrastructure for electric trains is impractical and expensive to build. Basically, the goal for railroads is to have locomotives that create zero emissions, all while not having to pay to build and maintain the expensive infrastructure to run electric trains. Chapter 2. History Repeats Itself Now you may think that railroads have never been in search of alternatively powered equipment, but surprisingly, you'd be wrong. In the 1940s, American railroads were in search of a new type of train for completely different reasons than they are now. As opposed to nowadays, when railroads are in search of affordable zero emissions equipment, in the 1940s, railroads were in search of the fastest trains possible. During this time, Union Pacific, the American Locomotive Company, and General Electric worked together to create a gas turbine locomotive that would come to be known as the GTEL, or Gas Turbine Electric Locomotive. This odd looking machine was capable of 65 miles per hour, all while making an impressive 4500 horsepower through fuel oil powered turbines. These monsters quickly found quite a bit of success in passenger service throughout the 1950s, being able to accelerate faster than their diesel counterparts, with the only trade-off being that they got horrible fuel mileage when compared to them. Ultimately, the GTELs only saw about 10 years of service before being retired for this reason, but regardless they were still very useful in some very specific cases, such as UAC's Turbo Train, which was able to hit a record top speed of 170 mph in 1967. Although gas turbine power never saw widespread success, has an important place in American railroad history as an example of a time when railroads have experimented with alternate power sources. So why exactly is this story relevant? Well 80 years later, American railroads are once again in search of change, but this time it isn't faster trains that they're looking for, but rather cleaner trains, capable of performing as well as diesel locomotives, costing less than electric locomotives, and of course producing zero emissions. Is this even possible? Find out with me in the next chapters of this video where I discover two modern alternative power sources, some examples of trains that use them, and which is the future of American railroading. Chapter 3. Battery Trains One example of this new breed of zero emissions rail equipment is battery powered trains and locomotives. Believe it or not, battery locomotives have actually existed since the mid 1800s when Scottish chemist Robert Davidson built a locomotive which ran off galvanic cells, an early form of batteries. This locomotive served as a proof of concept for future equipment, which came along almost a century later being used for underground mine trains in Alaska, where diesel fumes would cause issues. Over the course of the next century, occasional battery electric locomotives would make their way into the rail industry across the world, often being used in situations such as subways, where trains would have to not emit any deadly diesel fumes and tunnels, but still be able to run in places without third rail electricity. Over the years, battery technology progressed on to nickel iron and later lead acid, which were both far more efficient than galvanic cells, but still not efficient enough to see widespread adoption across the world. Once again, battery trains were only used in very specific applications, but never were they utilized in any major way. Regardless, as the years went on, battery technology continued to improve, and in the 1990s, batteries were more efficient than ever, with nickel metal hydride batteries finding their way into the transportation sector when the General Motors EV1, Honda Insight, and of course the Toyota Prius found varying amounts of success in the automotive world as electric and hybrid vehicles. Once again, this innovation led to more hype around battery powered transportation, but once again, nickel metal hydride batteries were still not efficient enough and thus not used on trains. Finally, in the mid 2000s, battery rail technology made a comeback, but only as a proof of concept. In 2007, Norfolk Southern received a federal grant to rebuild one GP38 diesel locomotive to run off battery electric power, making 1,350 horsepower from 1,080 lead acid batteries. This locomotive, known as the BP4 or battery powered 4 axle, was used for a press event to showcase the future of Norfolk Southern, and then shortly after it was placed into switching service in Altoona, Pennsylvania where it was built. Although it was Norfolk Southern's first zero emissions locomotive, it was found to be impractical and inefficient when compared to its diesel counterparts. In hopes that these issues could be resolved, in 2014, Norfolk Southern returned 999 to the shop, replacing its lead acid batteries with larger lead carbon batteries. Once again, it hit the high iron, this time with an enlarged roof section full of batteries, and once again, it caused issues for the railroad. So shortly after, 999 was placed into storage where it sat until 2019, when it was sold to Diesel Motive Company, who then sold it to Rail Propulsion Systems of Anaheim, California. Over the course of the next year, RPS would work to refine 999's issues, and that's where it stands now. The BP4 is currently being overhauled by RPS so it can finally become a reliable locomotive, and in a year or so, hopefully 999 will make a return, this time serving as a battery electric switcher locomotive in the Los Angeles Basin. 
Although the BP-4 was not really much of a success for Norfolk Southern, it was foreshadowing for the future of freight transport in not only North America, but the entire world. Anyways, let's go back to when the BP-4 was still brand new. At this time, electric cars weren't nearly as common as they are now, but this was all about to change, as a new startup known as Tesla was about to release something that would change the world of cars, and thus the entire world of transportation at large. In early 2008, a brand new electric car known as the Tesla Roadster hit the market. The Roadster was the first production car ever to use lithium-ion batteries, which are still some of the most efficient batteries around, but at the time, Tesla was just seen as a struggling California startup. Although those who were lucky enough to drive the Roadster praised it for its smooth acceleration and light chassis, the Roadster never saw widespread success and it was never really that profitable, as instead of Tesla building the car themselves, the Roadster was built by Lotus and then modified by Tesla to run off electric power. Regardless, of course now, Tesla is one of the most profitable car companies in the world, and one seldom recognized reason for this success is their use of the lithium ion battery which allowed Teslas to have some of the longest ranges and fastest acceleration times of any electric car. While many consider the BP-4 to be America's first modern battery electric locomotive, its use of archaic lead-based batteries always held it back. This new wave of more efficient lithium-ion batteries was sure to create change in the rail industry. In 2015, the Dallas Streetcar became America's first lithium-ion battery-powered train, although it wouldn't be a heavy rail locomotive like one would expect. Of course, the Dallas streetcar operates, well, streetcars, but a one-mile portion of their line lacks overhead electricity. In order to operate trains without installing expensive new catenary wires, Brookville Equipment created the Liberty series of streetcars which have batteries that recharge while connected to overhead electricity so that trains can temporarily operate off-wire. Since 2015, Brookville Liberty cars have proven reliable on countless different systems across the country, saving money by making overhead wires a thing of the past. Brookville Liberty was America's first lithium-ion battery-powered train, but it would certainly not be the last. In late 2019, Wabtec, one of America's largest locomotive manufacturers, completed their first ever battery electric locomotive. This new engine, known as the BEL44C4D, would be the world's first battery electric mainline freight locomotive, using the same basic design as a General Electric Evolution Series locomotive, while being built on a brand new platform known as FLX Drive. FLX Drive was truly a trailblazer, once again being the world's first battery electric mainline freight locomotive, all while making the same 4400 horsepower as a comparable diesel, but producing zero emissions at the same time. While FLX Drive was a very big deal for the future of American freight rail, Progress Rail, Wabtec's biggest competitor, wasn't going to stay quiet for long. In mid-2020, Progress Rail revealed their answer to Wabtec's FLX Drive. This odd-looking locomotive is called the Progress Rail Jewel, and unlike FLX Drive, it's a complete departure from traditional locomotive design. This brick-shaped locomotive is also intended for use as a long-distance locomotive, but it creates 1,400 fewer horsepower than FLX Drive and weighs just over half its weight. It's slightly less robust overall, making 493 kilonewtons of starting tractive effort as opposed to FLX Drive 640, but still, with Jewel and FLX Drive being released at the same time, there is bound to be quite the competition ahead. Soon enough, both manufacturers made plans to begin initial testing for their battery locomotives, with Wabtec testing their FLX Drive locomotive on BNSF in California in early 2021, and Progress Rail planning to test their Jewel locomotive on the Pacific Harbor Line a few months later. At this point, FLX Drive has successfully completed testing, while Jewel hasn't been delivered yet, but hopefully that'll change soon. Regardless, even if it hadn't been for the delays in the delivery of Jewel, it was still pretty clear that FLX Drive was a better locomotive overall due to its additional power over its competitor, but that would soon change as in early 2022, Australia's FMG would order two brand new 8-axle Jewel locomotives known as BE14.5 BBs. When delivered, these giants will be about as powerful as FLX Drive locomotives while having two extra axles for increased traction. Anyways, as of 2022, both locomotives have received quite a few orders from railroads despite the fact that battery power is still relatively new in the rail industry. Wabtec's FLX Drive is further along in its development process and thus has received the most orders, with 18 units being ordered by Roy Hill Mining, Canadian National, Rio Tinto, BHP, and Union Pacific. Slightly lagging behind with only 14 orders, the Progress Rail Jewel has been ordered by FMG, BHP, and Union Pacific. Of these orders, only two are for North American railroads, those being Canadian National and Union Pacific, with the most interesting being the latter, in which UP ordered the most battery locomotives of any railroad in the world, with a total of 20 to be delivered. 
Included in this massive order is 10 locomotives from each manufacturer, which makes it clear that Union Pacific intends to pit these two locomotives together in order to figure out which is the best, so when they're delivered in 2024, it'll certainly be an interesting testing phase to watch. Considering the fact that Union Pacific is North America's largest railroad, their massive order of battery electrics will most likely inspire even more railroads to follow suit, especially considering the fact that UP is committed to having net zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2050. Obviously in order to do this, Union Pacific will need to get rid of all their diesel locomotives, so whichever manufacturer produces the better battery locomotive will most likely receive an order of unprecedented size for Union Pacific, most likely for the replacement of their entire fleet of over 8,000 diesel locomotives. Regardless, that won't be for a long time, but what won't be in a long time is the first wave of battery locomotives hitting the rails in North America. As of right now, there are a select few short lines that already operate battery locomotives, but most orders for these two brand new long haul battery freight locomotives will begin to be fulfilled as soon as 2023. Anyways, up until this point, I've only talked about freight trains, but this is high speed rail week after all, where are the passenger trains? Well, the truth is that government funded passenger railroads can't afford to test out new innovations like privatized railroads can, so generally, freight railroads are the first to innovate and then passenger railroads follow. Luckily though, that isn't necessarily the case in this situation, as three separate American passenger railroads have already ordered their own fleets of battery powered trains. In April of 2021, within days of each other, two of the biggest commuter rails in the country announced their plans to test battery power out. The Long Island Railroad committed to retrofitting two M7 electric multiple unit cars to use Alstom battery propulsion systems, which will allow them to operate on the unelectrified Oyster Bay branch, becoming America's first battery electric passenger train. If these two cars are found to be reliable and efficient enough, battery rail technology could eventually replace all remaining diesel trains on Long Island, allowing for the nation's busiest commuter rail to create virtually zero emissions. Less than a week after the Long Island Railroad announced its plans to implement battery power, Chicago commuter rail Metra announced their plans to test out battery trains as well. Searching for a manufacturer to convert three of their F40PH-3 locomotives to battery power, being capable of pulling up to 11 cars at 79 miles per hour, providing power for their lights and other systems, and operating in Chicago's infamously cold winter weather. As of right now, no contract has been awarded to a manufacturer, but when one finally is, Metro will test these three locomotives on their Rock Island line. Once again, if these three prove reliable, battery locomotives could become the backbone of Metro, finally putting an end to their polluting diesel fleet. Still, there's one order for battery passenger trains that's even bigger than these two, this time coming from Amtrak. In July of 2021, Amtrak announced a $7.3 billion order for equipment built by Siemens Mobility and included in this order was 15 battery electric trains to be used on Amtrak's Empire service route in New York. When delivered in 2025, these battery powered trains will be America's first battery trains which once again will become even more widespread if successful. Much like battery freight locomotives, as the first railroads begin to commit to battery power, other railroads will take notice. Much like electric cars have become far more common over the past few years, battery trains will also most likely begin to find their way into the mainstream, popping up all around the country over the next few years. That is, if they can compete with another zero emissions power source which I'll talk about now. Chapter 4. Hydrogen Fuel Cell Trains Of course, battery technology seems to be surrounded by the most hype right now, but there's another zero emission power source that's also beginning to find its way into the rail industry, that of course being hydrogen fuel cell. Much like battery electric trains, hydrogen fuel cell finds its roots in the automotive industry as well, being first seen in 1966 with the General Motors Electrovan, a GMC handy van converted to never seen before hydrogen fuel cell technology, drawing electricity from the movement of oxygen ions across an electrochemical cell. This process is 100% zero emissions, creating only water as a byproduct, so much like battery power, it's pretty good for the environment. Unlike battery electric technology, which had been tested in the rail industry since the 1800s, a hydrogen fuel cell train wouldn't hit American rails until 2009, when BNSF would convert a rail-powered GG20B locomotive to run off electricity synthesized by hydrogen fuel cells. Like the battery-powered NSBP4, this locomotive, dubbed the HH20B, tested in the late 2000s, but it never saw widespread success, being placed into storage after only a few years of testing. Similarly, the HH20 would be the last hydrogen fuel cell locomotive for a while. Luckily though, in the late 2010s, the transportation industry began to focus a lot more on reducing their carbon emissions in hopes of slowing the effects of climate change. 
At the same time, a new California commuter rail, which would come to be known as Aero, was being planned out. This new commuter rail would provide frequent service between San Bernardino and Redlands, California while saving money by operating small local trains. As the planning process continued, it was found that electrification, while much better for the environment than diesel, would be far too costly to implement on the line. Reluctantly, in 2015, the agency placed an order for three Stadler Flirt diesel multiple unit train sets, but to show their commitment to zero emissions equipment, they also revealed their order for a fourth train built by Stadler, with this one using hydrogen fuel cell power instead of diesel. The first diesel train sets were delivered in late 2021, presumably to enter service for the grand opening of the line in 2022. Following the introduction of these diesels by two years, the hydrogen fuel cell train will be delivered in 2024, beginning testing shortly thereafter. As has been the case with battery powered trains, if this one hydrogen fuel cell train proves successful, up to three more will be ordered, fully replacing the diesel trains on the line. Speaking of battery trains, will there be a hydrogen freight locomotive to compete with the aforementioned battery freight locomotives? As is the answer with many things, kinda. In late 2020, Canadian Pacific announced their intentions to develop a brand new hydrogen powered locomotive to be classified as the H20EL. Unlike the battery locomotives built by devoted manufacturers, the H20EL will be rebuilt in-house from an existing SD40-2F locomotive, meaning that it will be based off an older locomotive design. Using six Ballard hydrogen fuel cells, the H20EL would produce about 1600 horsepower, making it slightly underpowered, yet still powerful enough to be used for local freight operations. Anyways, almost a year later, CP revealed official renderings of this locomotive in a new green paint scheme, with this rendering becoming a reality a few months later. In early 2022, CP's H2OEL rolled out of the shop, with the railroad announcing their plans to expand this project to a total of three locomotives instead of just one around the same time. As of right now, CP's first H2OEL, locomotive number 1001, is capable of running under its own power, but it hasn't officially begun testing yet, though CP says that this will change as soon as they're done constructing their two new hydrogen gas generation stations in Calgary and Edmonton which just so happen to be the two cities that they'll be testing this locomotive between later this year. While CP's H2OEL is just one relatively small project being undertaken by just one railroad, there's one hydrogen fuel cell locomotive that's being developed by an actual locomotive manufacturer, that one being Progress Rail, the same manufacturer as the battery-powered Joule locomotive. In September of 2021, Progress Rail announced their plans to develop a new hydrogen fuel cell freight locomotive in partnership with Chevron. As of right now, this project is still in its early stages, but in late 2021, the project gained even more support from a massive company in the transportation industry, that being BNSF Railway, one of the most profitable freight railroads in the country. With this newly gained support from BNSF, it's been made clear that once the first Progress Rail hydrogen locomotives are completed in the next few years, BNSF will most likely be the first railroad to test them. Overall, while battery locomotives seem to be further along in development than their hydrogen counterparts, they're both receiving lots of investment and research by many massive corporations. With that said, it's pretty clear that these two types of locomotives will most likely be tested against each other to determine which one is a better alternative to diesel. So which of these two power sources is better? Well, let's find out. Chapter 5. Which is better? While both battery and hydrogen fuel cell locomotives create zero carbon emissions, they both aren't perfect. First, let's begin with the issues associated with battery locomotives. While they're extremely efficient compared to diesel locomotives, with an efficiency percentage of about 85% as compared to about 30%, the lithium-ion batteries, in addition to the electricity they store, are potentially problematic. First, the biggest issue is the environmental problems associated with the production of lithium-ion batteries. The process of mining lithium is extremely inefficient, as not only is it hard to get in pure form, but also the mining process is quite detrimental, contaminating local water supply with harmful chemicals often making for a process that's terrible for the environment. The other issue is that in the United States, only about 20% of our electricity comes from environmentally friendly sources, with the other 80% still being derived from fossil fuels. The ultimate problem with any sort of electric rail technology is that until trains run completely off zero emissions electricity, there are still some emissions associated with them. Still, with this said, it's generally accepted that battery electric rail equipment is still better for the environment than diesel, so despite the bad effects battery production has on the environment, it's ultimately not as bad as the pollution caused by diesel emissions. Now how about hydrogen fuel cell? Isn't the only emission water? Yes, hydrogen fuel cell creates zero emissions, but that doesn't mean that's the perfect solution. 
With an efficiency rate of about 60%, it's not as effective as battery electric power, but that's not the big problem. Electrolysis, the process of creating the hydrogen gas used by fuel cell trains, is only about 80% effective, bringing the overall efficiency of fuel cell down to about 50%. Still better than diesel, but much worse than battery electric. Additionally, the cost of creating the facilities needed to create hydrogen gas is quite high. Overall, both of these power sources are much better than diesel and cheaper than overhead or third row electricity, but they both have their pitfalls. That's why railroads are placing their bets when it comes to the future, with railroads such as Canadian National and Union Pacific banking on battery electric and Canadian Pacific and BNSF banking on hydrogen. With this, it's clear that no railroad knows for sure which of these two alternative power sources are better, and that makes it a very important topic in the rail industry. But right now, neither of these power sources are ready to be fully implemented, and that's why over the next few years it'll be very interesting to see what happens in this battle for dominance in the American rail industry. Part 5. Timeline of America's High-Speed Rail Future Well nowadays, it's a well-known fact that America is lacking when it comes to high-speed rail, believe it or not, that hasn't always been the case. Back in high-speed rail's beginning, America was actually an early adopter of the technology, implementing it as early as 1969, but before we get ahead of ourselves, let's start where it all began on October 1st, 1964, when Japan showed the world their new Shinkansen, or new trunk line, for the first time. Unlike any train before it, the Shinkansen was capable of speeds of up to 130 miles per hour, making the trip between Tokyo and Osaka in a record-breaking 4 hours. This new concept of high-speed rail, although expensive to build, created a huge impact on Japan's economy, allowing people to travel between Japan's two biggest economic centers in a few hours rather than a full day. Inspired by Japan's new train, many other countries around the world began to dabble in high-speed rail, including the United States. On September 30, 1965, President Lyndon B. Johnson signed the High-Speed Ground Transportation Act of 1965, a piece of legislation that would go on to begin America's development of high-speed rail. From this point, North America's high-speed rail technology continued to develop, with some electric trains inspired by Japan's Shinkansen and some developments of all original gas turbine trains. One example of such a train took place on December 20, 1967, when the Canadian-designed UAC turbo train hit a top speed of 170 miles per hour while testing on the electrified Northeast Corridor in New Jersey. To this day, no train in America has gone faster than this, which really speaks to the fact that the United States used to be on the cutting edge of high-speed rail. Two years later, Penn Central began their new Metroliner service, America's first functional high-speed rail, providing 125 mile per hour high-speed rail service between New York and Washington, D.C. This new train saw quite a bit of success, and at 125 miles per hour, it was only slightly slower than Japan's Shinkansen. Still, as other countries continued the development of their own high-speed rail, American passenger railroads found themselves in a state of decline as automobiles were quickly gaining more popularity. This situation reached a boiling point in 1970 when Penn Central, one of America's largest railroads, declared bankruptcy. With this, the government was forced to take over most privatized passenger rail in the country, with a new company being formed for this very purpose. On May 1, 1971, Amtrak took over most privately funded passenger trains in America, and while it saved most American passenger rail services from discontinuation, it struggled to make a profit. This lack of profit quickly began a dark age for American passenger rail, in which Amtrak was just struggling to stay afloat, so anything more such as upgrading infrastructure was considered a pipe dream. For over 20 years, America's high-speed rail stayed the same as the rest of the world continued to improve. Finally though, after many years of virtually no improvement, High-speed rail came back into the picture when on December 18, 1991, the Intermodal Surface Transportation Efficiency Act was signed into law, laying out a plan for future high-speed rail corridors in the United States. Most importantly though, it incentivized Amtrak to finally get on track to creating their own high-speed train service. Just under a year after the signing of this bill, on October 20, 1992, a Swedish X-2000 train set arrived in America to serve as a demonstration of what the future of American passenger rail could look like. Not only did the X-2000 go on tour around America, but it also saw some revenue passenger service, giving regular people the opportunity to experience modern high-speed rail for themselves. A year later, on June 29, 1993, the X-2000 was joined by another foreign visitor, this time being a German ICE-1 train. The ICE did the same thing as the X-2000, gaining publicity for high-speed rail in America. With these two trains showing their strengths and weaknesses on American infrastructure, 
Amtrak worked to create their own all-new train which would be a combination of these two train strengths. On March 9, 1999, Amtrak introduced Americans to the country's first true high-speed rail which was called the Acela Express. Using all-new trains built by Alstom and Bombardier, the new Acela would provide service between Boston and Washington DC at speeds of up to 150 miles per hour for the new millennium. In preparation for the Acela, the Northeast Corridor was fully electrified between New Haven, Connecticut and Boston, Massachusetts, allowing for the electric trains to run non-stop for the full 450 mile journey between Boston and DC. The first trains ran under wires to Boston on January 31, 2000. Just under a year after that, on December 11, 2000, the Acela Express made its maiden voyage between Washington DC and Boston, and although it was able to hit a top speed of 150 miles per hour in some places, it still took almost 7 hours to traverse the 457 miles between its two terminals, mostly due to the older parts of its route where speed limits could dip as low as 50 miles per hour. Unfortunately, these sections of low speed track still slow down the Acela to this day, but let's look past that and recognize the Acela as what it is. America's first high-speed train. With such an achievement, Amtrak decided to take a break, so once again the development of new high-speed rail networks came to a standstill, with the Acela providing the only high-speed service in the country. Finally, almost a decade later, in late 2009, Lone Star High-Speed Rail LLC was formed to build a Dallas to Houston high-speed rail inspired by Japan's Shinkansen, which at that point had been built into a massive network, in some cases going as fast as 200 miles per hour. This company later came to be known as Texas Central, which I'll talk more about later. Later that year, on June 29th, 2009, BNSF unveiled their vehicle project HH-20B, which was America's first modern hydrogen fuel cell locomotive. Although it wasn't high-speed rail related at all, the HH-20B would be America's first zero-emissions locomotive, foreshadowing the zero-emissions arms race that would ensue in the near future. Rebuilt from a rail-power GG-20B genset locomotive, the HH-20B made 2,000 horsepower, all while creating no emissions but water, and although it wasn't much of a success, it served as a proof of concept for future railroads to take inspiration from. Similarly, a few years later, on September 28, 2014, Norfolk Southern unveiled their BP-4 locomotive. Rebuilt from a GP-38, the BP-4 was America's first modern battery electric locomotive, much like the HH-20B was America's first modern hydrogen fuel cell locomotive, but similarly, the BP-4 never saw any considerable success on the railroad, but it still served as a benchmark for future battery locomotives. A few months later, on November 12th, 2014, a new company known as All Aboard Florida began construction on a new higher speed rail line connecting two of Florida's biggest cities, Miami and Orlando. This initial construction would take place on the line between Miami and West Palm Beach, now known as Brightline, America's first privately funded high speed rail. Following this construction, on January 6, 2015, California's state-funded high-speed rail project began construction on its line in the Central Valley. Unlike Brightline, which would use diesel trains, California high-speed rail would use 200 mile per hour electric trains, the likes of which had never been seen in America. Later in 2015, on April 13th, the Dallas Streetcar began service, which may not seem like a big deal, but this would be America's first passenger train to use battery electric power. As in order to operate on part of the line which lacks overhead wires, trains would use onboard battery packs. The next year, on August 26, 2016, Amtrak announced their order of 28 all new Avalia Liberty train sets, which would replace the first generation Acelas. These new trains would be able to operate at up to 220 miles per hour with proper infrastructure upgrades, but without these upgrades, they would just serve as a replacement for the aging first gen Acelas. A few years later, only about four years after construction began, Brightline ran their inaugural service on their line between Fort Lauderdale and West Palm Beach on January 13, 2018. Later in the year, service would begin to Miami, and construction would continue for the line to Orlando. Additionally, towards the end of the year, on September 18, 2018, Brightline announced their acquisition of Express West, a high-speed rail line between Los Angeles and Las Vegas. It would soon be rebranded to Brightline West showing the transportation world that Brightline intended to expand their network to across the country. Just over a year later, on September 22, 2019, Wabtec released their new FLX Drive locomotive, America's first battery electric long distance freight locomotive. This FLX Drive locomotive, otherwise known as the BEL44C4D, would create a comparable amount of power to its diesel counterpart, 
all while producing zero emissions. Continuing the theme of zero emissions trains, on November 15, 2019, Future California Commuter Rail Aero ordered a Stadler Flirt train powered by hydrogen fuel cell. Not only was this America's first hydrogen fuel cell passenger train, but it was also one of the first Stadler built trains in America, which are very common in Europe. Just under a year later, in the summer of 2020, about a year after Wabtec's announcement of their FLX drive locomotive, Progress Rail, Wabtec's biggest competitor, issued their rebuttal to the FLX battery electric freight locomotive, releasing their new Jewel platform. While FLX drive bared similarities to past locomotives, Jewel was an all new design, resembling no other American locomotive before it. About a year later, on July 7, 2021, Amtrak announced a $7.3 billion contract with Siemens Mobility for an entire fleet of all new train sets, making for the biggest equipment order in Amtrak's history. This order would replace aging equipment across Amtrak's system, some of which was over 40 years old, with brand new Siemens built trains which many considered to be some of the best. Not only would these trains improve passenger experiences with modernized interiors, but they would also improve Amtrak's environmental impact, creating fewer diesel emissions than any other passenger trains in America. Additionally, included in this order was a small fleet of experimental battery electric train sets, which would be the first in Amtrak's history, once again showing Amtrak's commitment to creating modern, environmentally friendly transportation. Speaking of environmentally friendly transportation, just a few months later, on November 4th, 2021, Canadian National announced their order of one Wabtec FLX Drive battery locomotive, becoming the first railroad in North America to order one of these new long-distance battery locomotives. Although CN only ordered one locomotive, this announcement created quite a bit of hype in the freight rail industry, leading to a few subsequent battery locomotive orders from North American railroads. The next month, on December 6, 2021, Union Pacific announced their plan to have net zero emissions by 2050 through the use of battery electric locomotives and low carbon fuels. This would ensue in an order for the railroad's first zero emissions locomotives which I'll talk about later. A few weeks later, on December 14, 2021, after concluding a period of testing a Wabtec FLX drive battery locomotive, BNSF entered an agreement with Progress Rail and Chevron to develop a hydrogen fuel cell locomotive. This positioned BNSF as a railroad that placed their support under hydrogen fuel cell as the future, as opposed to battery electric, so at this point it became clear to many that there would soon be an arms race between hydrogen and batteries to determine which, if any, will become the future of North American freight rail. In other hydrogen rail news, a month later, on January 24, 2022, Canadian Pacific unveiled their first zero emissions locomotive, known as the H20EL. Rebuilt from an SD40-2F diesel, this locomotive was the first of three hydrogen fuel cell locomotives built by CP. Four days later, on the 28th, Union Pacific placed their support in battery locomotives, ordering 20 battery electric locomotives from Progress Rail and Wabtec, with 10 locomotives being built by each manufacturer. To date, this is the largest North American order for battery electric freight locomotives, with a much larger order likely being placed once Union Pacific determines which of these two locomotives is superior. A few weeks later, on February 8th, the first Siemens ALC42 locomotive entered service on Amtrak, beginning the process of replacing older polluting Genesis locomotives with new locomotives creating 89% fewer emissions. Finally, on March 9, 2022, Via Rail, Canada's national passenger railroad, proposed a new electrified line between Toronto and Quebec City, potentially creating Canada's first high-speed rail. Depending on how this project is managed, this could do for Canada what the Intermodal Surface Transportation Efficiency Act did for America over 30 years ago. With that, we're at the current day, but that's not the end of our story. What does the future hold? Well, considering the fact that people are becoming more focused on creating transportation that's better for the environment, the future seems pretty bright. Let's take a look. Speaking of bright, not too far from now, in early 2023, Brightline West plans to begin construction on their new 180 mile per hour electrified high speed rail line between just outside of Los Angeles and Las Vegas. Additionally, later in 2023, Brightline, the one in Florida, will begin service to Orlando, finally completing the original plan for Miami to Orlando service. Additionally, trains will travel at up to 125 miles per hour, making Brightline a legitimately fast train service compared to right now, when it only goes 79 miles per hour at most. Finally, around the same time, 
Texas Central plans to begin construction on their Dallas to Houston line as well, making 2023 a big year for high-speed rail construction across the country. Unfortunately though, construction may not actually begin at this time, as Texas Central is still dealing with some land disputes. This is just a projection of when they expect to begin. In other high-speed rail news, Amtrak plans to have the first Acela 2 trains in service by the end of 2023. While they were initially planned to enter service in 2021, mechanical issues with the trains have delayed their debut quite a bit as modifications have to be made to the trains in order to begin service. Separate from all the high-speed rail construction, throughout 2023 and into early 2024, railroads such as Union Pacific, Canadian National, and multiple Australian railroads will begin to receive their first battery electric locomotives which they've placed orders for over the past few years. This is when the competition between battery and hydrogen trains will truly begin in North America as 2023 will mark the beginning of the widespread adoption of both of these zero emissions power sources. In early 2025, Caltrain, the commuter rail that runs between San Francisco and San Jose, California, will complete CalMod, their project to modernize their commuter network with electric trains. While this isn't necessarily high-speed rail, it's what many consider to be the first true modernized commuter rail in the United States using European-style trains and infrastructure. Later in 2025, Amtrak will have received their full fleet of 28 Acela 2 train sets, allowing for the retirement of Amtrak's first high-speed trains. When they're retired, most likely at least one train will be preserved, as these trains marked a very historic part of railroad history in America, but the trains that will replace these 1990s-era train sets will be more efficient, faster, and nicer for passengers. From this point on, tentative dates for each of these projects become a little bit more ambiguous. At some point in 2026, Brightline West service will begin between Victorville, California and Las Vegas, Nevada. Of course, that is assuming that construction begins on time in 2023, but right now they're on track to begin then. In the same year, on the other side of the country, Florida's Brightline, which may be rebranded to Brightline East, will complete their extension west of Orlando International Airport to Disney Springs providing a connection between the airport and one of Orlando's biggest tourist attractions. A few years later, in 2028, Texas Central will hopefully complete construction and begin service, assuming that they begin construction on time in 2023. Although I didn't talk about it much during High Speed Rail Week 2, it's still a big part of America's future High Speed Rail network using Japanese N700S train sets capable of 200 miles per hour. Additionally, by 2028, Brightline will complete their extension to Tampa, Florida creating a full-length, higher-speed rail line between Miami and Tampa, Florida's two biggest metropolitan areas. The next year, again, if all goes according to plan, California High-Speed Rail will open their initial Central Valley segment of their line, finally creating the high-speed rail service in California that will have been in the works for over three decades. As for the rest of the line, construction will continue for a few more years. By the end of the next year, 2030, Amtrak will have a brand new fleet of trains built by Siemens Mobility including dual-mode diesel and electric locomotives, in addition to some battery locomotives. Additionally, the majority of their fleet will comprise of the same types of Siemens Venture cars, making for easier fleet maintenance, among many other benefits. Finally, in 2033, California High Speed Rail will begin service between San Francisco and Los Angeles, making what will most likely be one of America's most important rail corridors. After this point, who's to say what'll happen? Hopefully, by this point, most politicians will agree that the United States needs national high-speed rail, along for the full construction of an electrified, high-speed, and environmentally friendly network, but who knows? Anything could happen. Perhaps we could see maglev technology, or perhaps high-speed rail will continue to be a thing only seen in a select few regions. Ultimately, all we can hope for is the best with the continued development of high-speed rail in North America. In an ideal world, these projects could be completed, but unfortunately, as such a divided nation, there's bound to be pushback. Between industry lobbyists convincing politicians to oppose these projects, NIMBYs, and people ignorant to the economic and environmental benefits of high-speed rail, it won't be easy, but maybe one day, many years from now, the United States may finally have a high-speed rail network that can lead the rest of the world instead of lag behind. Part 6. Editor's Note and there you go, that's the end of High Speed Rail Week 2. If you've made it all the way to the end, I think it's safe to say that you're one of my most loyal viewers, so I want to say how genuinely grateful I am for each and every one of you. Just over a year ago when I uploaded the first part of High Speed Rail Week 2, I never knew how much of an impact it would have on my YouTube channel, but now, a year in the future, my YouTube channel has gained thousands of subscribers, 
and the fact that I always have an audience to watch my videos keeps me motivated to keep creating content. That motivation has been instrumental in the creation of this series, as these videos have been months in the making. Over these months, I've managed to create this documentary all by myself, aside from the help of my friend Jake from the Believe God YouTube channel, who helped to edit voiceovers for me. I really do think that all this effort has paid off, as I would consider High Speed Real Week 2 to be my best video creation to date. But with that said, I hope it doesn't stay that way, as I intend to keep creating engaging content for as long as I can, and with your continued support, I can do that. Be sure to stay tuned for more content, and if you want to continue to follow these stories as they develop, be sure to watch my monthly news series This Month on the Railroad, which is uploaded on the first of every month, recapping the big train news stories of each month. Other than that, thanks for watching, and I'll see you very soon in another video.